Uh, welcome everyone to the first ever Two Ball Blog podcast. I'm Sebastian Quinn. I created this blog as a part of my degree with university and just figured to keep it on the side to talk about uh, NBA and the English Premier League as well. Uh, it'll be mostly NBA at the moment, just with it being the off season and um, the Premier League also, you know, they're conducting their off season training and uh, world tours and whatnot. Uh, so it's mostly NBA with free agency um, coming down and summer league starting to kick in. Uh, just the blog, just to maintain it as a um, uh, as a something to go in my portfolio once I finish the degree, and um, hopefully help me out with uh, job prospects, which isn't looking the best in Australia at the moment. But that doesn't really matter right now. Uh, the best way to contact me is probably through the Facebook page. Just search Two Ball Blog. It's pretty small at the moment, something like thirty likes, but uh, we'll get there eventually, hopefully. And then also Twitter. I'm on. Um, Twitter as well, Sebastian underscore Quinn. So it's basically Sebastian, but no T. Anyway, so we'll jump right into free agency with uh, the DeAndre Jordan saga, which has been probably the the hot topic for the past uh, week and a bit. Because uh, in about the first week of uh, free agency, on about July 6th or so, uh, DeAndre Jordan agreed verbally agreed with the Dallas Mavericks to a four-year deal worth $80 million uh, dollars. And so that would see him leave the Clippers and would also see the Clippers have pretty much no center to fill in because they got rid of um, Spencer Hawes. He went to the 76ers, I'm pretty sure. And he's um, and then all they'd be left with, sorry, is Big Baby Davis and Ekip Udo, who, well, you know, are nowhere near the caliber of what, you know, DeAndre Jordan was for them. Uh, so DeAndre agreed with Dallas and Mark Cuban uh, for a four-year deal, and then come July 9th, when the moratorium lifted, uh, the Dallas Mavericks, uh, what's Doc, Doc Rivers, Steve Barmer, uh, Blake, and CP3 went over to DeAndre's house in uh, Houston, and pretty much locked everyone out until DeAndre signed with them. So Jordan wanted a bigger role with Dallas, and one of the main reasons I would say for him wanting to leave was um. For him to get more touches and become, you know, but he wanted, he, there's a quote for him saying he wants to be the man. Uh, and also, you know, he wants to be a bigger part of the offense, wants to step up. And then there's another quote from him in regards to Chris Paul. And he, he's saying that he's sick of his uh, petty gestures and constant barking, which um, you'd have to agree with. But that sort of thing comes with who Chris Paul is. He's a natural leader. He's one of those edgy playmakers that are going to push you to the limit to become a better player. And, I mean, if there's any um, any reason for Jordan to leave, I would say that would be one of the main ones. Because there was that game in the Clippers series against the Spurs where uh, Chris Paul missed the, um, missed the game-winning shot and then Jordan caught the ball after the shot clock expired, but the normal game clock still had three or four seconds left. So, of course, Chris Paul's jumping up and down, shoot the ball, shoot the ball. I'll put a video in the link in the uh, description of the video. But, um... You know, there's that sort of thing, and then apparently he didn't high five uh, Jordan in uh, in game huddles over the course of his time with the Clippers. You know, you go around. Chris Paul apparently made a point of it to go around and high five each player, and you know he would seek out Blake and seek out you know Jamal Crawford, but he'd intentionally not give it to um, DeAndre Jordan, just I don't know, kind of in spite of him. So, you know, there's all these things that've been building up for Jordan, and I, I mean I don't blame him for wanting to leave. I think, um, especially over the off season, I think uh, two years ago or so, uh, Chris Paul was really asking him to. He's like, "Listen, you got to improve your free throw percentage, and this sort of thing is going to cost us." And that's um, it. Really came, really became more prevalent this year with the hacker Jordan strategy, and and to the point where it became a really hot to- talking point uh, with people about you know how do we get rid of this rule? What do we do about it? Should he improve his free throw percentage? Should he? Um, you know, should we take him off the floor? Do we change the rules? What do we do? So, obviously, it's a big deal for him to um, not be able to hit those free throws. And I suppose you can see it from both sides of the argu- of their um, their point of views. Chris Paul, you know, really frustrated with him because that sort of thing allows teams to come back into the game. You look at um, the Houston series where they came back from three games to one to win the win the series four three. While they didn't use the Hagrid Jordan series, um, what's his technique? Constantly, it was definitely a part of the offense that you know it definitely came in handy, especially in Game Five and also Game Six, where it allowed them to come back from 18 points down. Um, so anyway, back to the DeAndre Jordan, the whole thing. So he ends up signing with the Clippers, a similar deal, four years, 80 million or so. 
And so he would have just um, fit right in with Dallas, I would say. Well, he is an, um, he, I would say he's an elite, elite athlete and a great shot blocker, but he's not the best defender in terms of one-on-one defense. So he's fit with the Clippers, as I already mentioned. Um, was just, you know, he would hardly get any post-ups. He, he was largely a pick-and-roll guy, but, I mean, you can only do a you can only play a pick and roll so many times in a game for the one player. And if Jordan wants more touches with Dallas, he was asking for post-ups. He was asking for, you know, all these other plays that are made for him to score. Uh, but with the Clippers, he's always going to have that role. But it is a good role. He is, he is in a championship situation. There is that um, there is that potential to win a title with them. I mean, had it um, if it wasn't for the Houston series then it would have just been... I would say Clippers would have gone on. Maybe they maybe not have beaten the Golden State Warriors, but it wouldn't have been a gentleman's sweep like the Houston Rockets fell apart um, in that series. So, you know, Jordan wants that bigger role. He fits right in with Blake Griffin, fits right in there with CP3. Maybe not, um, you know, on the off-court sense, but on the court, you can tell they, they click really well and there is that chemistry with them. With Dallas, on the other hand, um, Tyson Chandler, who... Um, took off and then of course they wanted to fill that void with um dj um, i'll talk about chandler later actually yeah he would have fit in um dj would have fit in quite well with him as you know dirk's obviously getting slower though they, he was really exposed in the houston series and then um dallas brought in all these other pieces which i'll talk about later which i'll talk about later sorry that um would have worked really well with him i mean he probably would still be getting uh similar touches probably still pick and rolls i mean he doesn't have an offensive game outside of dunks. And as much as he'd like to think, you know, maybe a over-the-shoulder hook or something like that, it's really not consistent enough for him to be even considered a threat outside of the paint. And then, you know, maybe a maybe a floater at best, but you can't really see... You're not going to double-team him unless he's absolutely throwing it down on top of people, which he has. I'll give that to DJ, but he's not about... He's not any threat from outside the paint, I would say. Even outside his arm, re- the reach of his arm which are you know, pretty long as it is. Uh, so, who had DJ gone, like I said earlier, Ikiputo, Glenn Davis, I mean, not the best backups, and then, you know, the Clippers would have been stuck. So they really needed to court him and really, you know, woo him in a sense that, you know, we really need you to be a part of this team. Uh, especially after, it, it seemed very serious that he's signing it. Well, it was a definite verbal agreement, verbal agreement. And, you know, he, he was essentially gone. So, um, he flip-flopped, went back to the Clippers, and he apologized on Twitter to Mark Cuban, you know, world-class organization, you know, very cliche stuff. And then, so, of course, Cuban replies uh, with somewhat of a riddle saying, you know, when is an apology not an apology when someone else writes it for you? So, you know, he was naturally very upset when someone agrees with you on something like that. And then, you know, I don't blame him for being... Um, being upset at Jordan for just, you know, flip-flopping and heading back to the Clippers, especially after dealing Tyson Chandler to the Suns. Um, sorry, after letting him sign with the Suns and not offering him a contract. So, I mean, um, yeah, Cuban at a summer league, you know, a few days just gone, just pretended not to know um, know who he was when he was being interviewed. They asked him, he was like, oh, you know, what's your, uh, what's your, how do you feel towards John J. Jordan? And Mark Cuban's like, oh, I don't know who you're talking about. So, um, yeah, don't blame him for <clears throat> don't blame him one bit. And DeAndre um, reportedly apparently told him, told Cuban that he was on a date. That's why he couldn't um, couldn't see him while he was in Houston to finish signing that contract once the clock hit midnight. So, you know, very shady, very deceitful. But I mean, in the NBA, I suppose if you win, if DJ wins a championship this year, then all of this will be forgotten, and um, that'll be it. And it'll be a start of a new era of um, titles. So, you know, I think DeAndre would have been. Um, He's a great fit for the Clippers. You know, if he sticks to his role, just puts his head down and sticks to it, you know, they'll be a championship contending team. Just they really need to add depth to their bench, but uh, that's a whole other podcast to talk about. And yeah, so they've kind of left Dallas high and dry, despite um, their good signings. They have brought in a few players. They signed Wesley Matthews on a four year deal um, from the Blazers. And, you know, that, uh, that was to replace Monte Ellis after he took off to. Um, the Indiana Pacers, and so Wesley Matthews, one of the definitely one of the better shooting guards, shooting guards in the NBA. You know, two-way player. He's, uh, you know, back down. Uh, it was just that year, you know a year ago in the first round where he was taking on James Harden and lighting him up from deep, and then also defending him on the other end. So he'll be a great acquisition for um 
for Dallas. I mean, his stock definitely went down after picking up the ACL injury uh, early, in, uh, sorry, late last season. But um, I suppose Dallas will definitely get the best of his prime. He's about eight, uh, 28. He's 28 uh, years old, so heading definitely heading into his prime now. So and then also the um, Brooklyn Nets have bought out Deron Williams, so he's he's out of there with what definitely one of the bigger contracts for Dallas to take on. But I suppose. When you've got an owner like Mark Cuban, money isn't exactly a um, worry for them. So they've taken him on at the point guard position where they definitely needed help. I mean, uh, Rondo was horrendous for them last year. He's taken off to the Kings and about to make another train wreck over there. God, you know, good luck to them and Boogie. Um, so hopefully, you know, it, it was only a few years ago where, where Williams was in the conversation for, you know, is he the best point guard in the game right now? He, you know, he was up there with Chris Paul. Um, you know, there was that debate between the two of them, you know, he he can score, he can dish, he can do everything, so, you know, it was like a year ago where he dropped 54 against um, uh, the Timberwolves, so it's, you kind of hope for, you want to see Williams to be a successful player, you know, he hasn't done anything where you just want to, you want to see him fail, you want to see these type of players, having reached such a high peak, um, recapture that form, but it looks highly unlikely at the moment. He's just been very lackluster. Uh, last year, he scored like eight, eight, a total of eight points in the playoffs um, in that first round series. I mean, it's just, it's definitely not the same player. And he's really taken a huge step back from where he was with Utah, at least. Um, so with Tyson Chandler going to the Suns on a um, $60 million contract, I'll talk about that later. The uh, Mavericks brought in Zaza Petrulia, who's I mean, um, taken off from Milwaukee Bucks, and he's essentially just to do the same job that Tyson Chandler was doing, but just on the cheap. So, you know, he's a, a decent rim protector. He's not going to score you. He's not going to score you 20 points a game. You know, maybe uh, eight points, five rebounds, nothing special, but he's a big body, and he'll get in the way of most players. It was um, around 2009 you know, where the uh, Magic played the Hawks in the... Um, in the Eastern Conference Finals, where he became the Dwight stopper, which, um, I mean, that was, you know, four or five years ago, but there is that defensive, not so much a huge presence, but he'll do the job for you. He's solid. That's all he can really say. And then, so, Tyson Chandler, on the other hand, heading to the Suns, on a four-year, $60 million deal, this really, this deal really um, got me a bit edgy, because, I mean, Chandler's a, Chandler's a great defender, but $60 million... For a player who gives you uh, 10 points, 10 plus rebounds, and, you know, he organizes your defense, organizes the defensive sets, is really, really too much money for me. I mean, I know there's the cap explosion next year. It all goes up 70 million, and there is this um, excess of money. You know, everyone's getting max contracts and four-year deal here, four-year deal there. But 60 million for a player who's 32 years old, a four-year contract which will take him to 36. Now, Chandler had great years with New York, played really well with New Orleans. In his first run, in the first um, run around with Dallas, he was an excellent defender, really helped Dirk. But these next coming four years, he's going to be on the decline. There's really... No, I mean, he can off, he'll still give you rebounds, still give you blocks. He's not going to be scoring any points, but it just really frustrates me to see 60 million go to waste, especially to a young Suns team who really should be trying to develop. You know, what happened to Alex Len? Sure, he, you know, had an injury at the beginning of his uh, first NBA season, but with someone with that kind of length, or still on his rookie contract, I mean, why not develop him, especially considering that the Suns really are up in the air with what they want to do. They got rid of Dragic. They got rid of, um, you know, they've still got Bledsoe, sorry. They got rid of Isaiah Thomas. Like, they're really up in the air. They're probably stuck in NBA purgatory. Which is, you know, not quite a lottery team, but not quite a playoff team. So, I mean, you sign an aging center to, for a four-year contract, it's really, really not a good decision for them, in my opinion, at least. So, uh, it would be interesting to see what they do there. The only redeem, what would have redeemed this deal for me would have been if they signed LaMarcus Aldridge. Um, because LA, uh, Aldridge works well with uh, defensive center. He had that in Robin Lopez while he was in, at the Blazers. And so if you sign a good defensive center with him, you know, it takes, it takes away those, the defensive duties for him. Not takes them away completely, but definitely lessens it um, for him. You know, there's, uh, Aldridge doesn't have to play center for them because he can fill in a power forward and he doesn't, he doesn't have to bang with Dwight Howard, doesn't have to take on the Marcus Souls, 
you know, he would have to defend uh, Zach Randolph every now and then. But in terms of the bigger centers, like Joe Kim Noah, for instance, um, you know, Aldridge doesn't have to deal with him. You can leave that for, you know, Robin Lopez in Portland. He can leave it for uh, Chandler at the Suns. And apparently this, uh, apparently Phoenix were pretty good con- good contenders to actually sign um, Aldridge. But, um, I mean, I don't, I don't blame him one bit for going to the Spurs. And, I mean, it's probably the best signing of this offseason at the moment. Like he's he's from Texas, you know, thirty years old. He's still got a good eight, good four years in him. Sorry, four or five years. The way he plays doesn't really it isn't really relying on um athleticism. He can you know back to the basket, turn around, jump shot, anywhere from six to eighteen feet. He can bank it in. You know, it's almost automatic from the right hand elbow. So essentially, it's a passing of a torch from Tim Duncan over to Aldridge. And what's nice is actually Bruce Bowen came out and gave his blessing to um Aldridge to take on that. Uh, number 12 so you know the Spurs have welcomed him as a family that's their whole uh, mantra at the moment all over their Facebook and Twitter welcome to the family LaMarcus and well I mean you know of course they're going to be happy when they've signed this 30 year old who's essentially going to carry them past the Tim Duncan and Martin Ginobili era and you know those two have agreed to stay on for another two uh, another two years Ginobili for two years Duncan for one at least and um you know, they'll be mentoring him, but, you know, they, they did trade away uh, Tiago Splitter to the Hawks, but, I mean, that did, that gave, that's what gave them enough uh, cap space to actually sign him on the max, max contract, so I would envisage um, Duncan playing center, LaMarcus at the power forward position, Kawhi Leonard small forward, you know, Danny Green up there, and, of course, Tony Parker, and then Ginobili off the bench, so, I mean, it, it would be a surprise to see if Spurs got eliminated in the first round again this year, but I can't see that happening. Look for another 55-win team. You know, they'll be up there again. Popovich is still there. It's um, really no different. If they didn't get match up with the Clippers this year, uh, say they got hit with the Rockets or uh, maybe the Grizzlies or the Blazers, pretty much anyone but them, uh, you could definitely see them going to the Western Con- Conference Finals. And it would have been a great game against the... Um, against the Golden State Warriors because they only lost two games against uh, two games at home at the Oracle and that first game came from the Spurs I mean uh, the way they play they want to slow the pace and they're going to do that they're going to get their shots and they're just going to um, play hard defensively so uh, it it would be good to watch them coming up this year and see how they go and then also they picked up um, David West and this was a huge for some reason a huge controversy I didn't see it as that bad of a um you know, people are talking about it. Oh, it's blasphemous of uh, David West to sign for a one-year vet million, vet minimum. Sorry, you know he gave up ten million dollars. Blah blah blah. All this crap. So his his player option with the Indiana Pacers was a uh, twelve million dollar deal for that one season. He declined that. The Wizards the Wizards offered him a six million dollar deal. He declined that, and now he signed with the Spurs for a one-year one point two million vet minimum, and. Everyone's thrown out their arms saying, you know, you've given up so much money. What are you doing? This and that. And I mean, it makes sense for West. He's, he's 32 years old. He's played on a, um, played on a early Hornets team that was really, um, never contending for anything seriously, at least, you know, he moved to Indiana and then, you know, made it to the, um, Eastern conference finals led by Paul George and everything. But I don't think he's really ever come close to winning something properly. You know, at 32 years old at this point. You want to do what makes you happy. You want to do what, you know, he wants that silverware. That's all that really can be said. So, I mean, I don't blame him one bit for, you know, signing with the Spurs. That That's probably outside of the Warriors and maybe the Cavs, who would be the favorites for next year again. Um, the Spurs would definitely be your best option. So, I don't blame him one bit and I don't see the huge fuss about it. So, anyway, moving on. After everyone's left Lillard, and the Blazers, they signed him to a max contract for $120 million, and then just uh, early today, actually, acquired Mo Harkless from the Magic for a second-round pick. And so, you know, they're rebuilding their roster and everything. It's definitely the end of an era for um, for the Blazers, which quite surprisingly, because they did have a few injuries this year. They um, finished fourth in uh, the uh, Western Conference. Had quite a good year. Can't really fault them that much, but I mean... I suppose that they were stuck in that not quite good enough to be contending when you've got the Warriors, when you've got the Clippers, um, not quite ready to put the Rockets up there with as a um, legitimate title contender. They still need a few pieces to fill in, but um, yeah. So pretty much everyone's gone. 
they've just cut their losses, keep Lillard on as a young point guard. That's probably the best way to start rebuilding and just um, see how that's gone. So that's probably your best starting point. Mo Harkless is really good. Well, not really good, but he has a lot of potential coming up as a 22-year-old. Um, really hasn't been used all that much from the Magic because Tobias Harris moved to the small forward position. So he was in and out of the lineup. Uh, it would be interesting to see where the Port- Portland Trailblazers go from here. I mean, they can still sign a few players. They're, there was a lot of money left on the table. I mean, uh, Batum over to the Hornets. Uh, you know, they saved a fair bit of money on there. They got Gerald Henderson coming back. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for them to really change their team and do what they want with it. So, I mean, Robin Lopez went to the Knicks uh, on a four-year contract. And he was, um, funnily enough, he was the backup plan for if DeAndre Jordan didn't go to the Knicks, which is... um. I don't know, New York, um, even though they're a big market team, I still don't, there's still, there's no belief from the players outside of New York that they're going to be contending for anything. I mean, you look at last season, Carmelo Anthony, you got Derek Fisher as a new coach, you got, uh, what's his, Phil Jackson, Phil Jackson, sorry, coming in as a GM, kind of player manager, and, you know, they still did terribly. Melo played up until the All-Star game so he can get his votes and then uh, stop playing, trying to recruit players, but... You know, you look at their lineup, they had, you know, Andre Bagnani, who actually just got signed by the Nets um, earlier this afternoon, uh, running Jose Calderon, uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., who's a good young player, but I mean, when you're stuck on such a crappy team, taking so many just uh, bad shots, ill-advised, like, you know, you can only um, you can only develop a player so much when you're only on such a crappy team. So, it's really not an appealing uh, role for him, uh, not an appealing team to go to, sorry, and yeah, I don't blame anyone for not really wanting to go there, and then I kind of feel bad for uh, Chris Stapps Porzingis after being selected by the Knicks, you know, watching some highlights on YouTube, I'm not a huge um, college man myself, or you know, uh, NBA draft in general, but watching some um, some of his moves on YouTube and whatnot, he's, you know, he's got some good length, so, you know, he's a young kid at 19, give him some time to um, develop, and, you know, he might be a good, um, you know, my, my analysis of it was probably a good um, what uh, Donatus Montiunis, which, you know, isn't a bad thing. This year, before he went down with the injury, well, he was averaging 18 points and 9 rebounds. I mean, that sort of thing for a playoff team just, you know, fills in a good role, and that's all you really got to do. But the Knicks fans, you know, booing him, and I mean, I don't blame them. They must be incredibly frustrated with Phil Jackson and the whole organization with just how they're conducting themselves, playing so poorly, this and that, and... I mean, um, they really, really need to turn it around. They're stuck with Carmelo for another five years, four years, sorry. But, um, yeah, just stuck with Melo, and he, he's still a black hole on offense, doesn't play defense. Yeah, still considered to be a superstar, and, you know, when you score as much as he does, then uh, I don't blame him whatsoever, but it's just, um, it's hard to recruit players to a losing team. That's that's all you can really say, all you can really say, sorry. So, I mean... You know, uh, Robin Lopez to them, you know, good defensive center. He's a cheaper version of uh, Tyson Chandler, to be honest with you, a much better passer as well. So, I mean, if the Suns signed Robin Lopez to a, you know, four-year, 45 million contract, then I'd be pretty happy. But, yeah, 60 million for Tyson Chandler is ridiculous. Uh, Batum, like I said already, to the Hornets, Wesley Matthews to the to Dallas Mavericks, and, yeah, Lillard's all there alone by himself. So, yeah, should be an interesting season coming up for them. Uh, moving on, you've got LeBron James uh, signing on for another two years, forty-six million dollars, and you know it's um he was he was sitting back to you know wait, waiting and wanted to wait and see just how um what the Cavaliers did to sign more players to uh you know appease LeBron to make sure he stays again, and obviously Dan Gilbert you know he he stuffed up the first time. I don't think he's really willing to to do that again. You know after not bringing in enough help, you know, LeBron made the finals pretty much by himself in his first go-round at um, Cleveland, and, you know, deep down, I think most of us knew that LeBron was going to stay, but um, I don't think Dan Gilbert was taking any chances, it, it would be, it would be terrible for LeBron, like, it, there's no beating about if he left Cleveland again, then you can forget about him ever being considered in the Mount Rushmore um, of the NBA, you know, the top five, like, when you leave a team twice, um, especially when it's a hometown team, you you know you're heralded as the next Jordan, the next uh, whoever. You know, even Scotty Pippen compared him to himself, but I think LeBron's a bit more of a um, offensive player than Pippen ever was. 
um, when you leave that team twice because you failed to bring a title to them because there wasn't enough help, then I mean you you can kiss that um, you can kiss that legacy goodbye to put it simply. Um, so yeah, I don't think LeBron was ever going to leave. He just wanted to sit back, kind of tease tease the Cavs and say, well, you know, I might just do it again this time. And so yeah, like I said, Dan Dan Gilbert taking no chances. So re-signed Shumpert. Um, a lot of rumors for trade with Joe Johnson, which was incredibly surprising for me, uh, because the Cavs don't really have any pieces to give away. I mean, the rumor was uh, Anderson Verjao and Brandon Haywood uh, for Joe Johnson's huge contract, but I mean, well, uh, uh, there's there would be absolutely no reason whatsoever for the Nets to take on those two players. I mean, they've they just lost Alan Anderson. Not that he was a huge player for them. They just waived. Deron Williams. The last thing they need is Anderson Verja and Brennan Haywood. I mean, good centers. Uh, Haywood's, you know, end of his career, just, you know, sit on the bench, make, you know, veteran leadership, you know, in air quotes, um, in the locker room. And then Verja would have been a good backup for um, Brooke Lopez. But are you really going to give up Joe Johnson after, especially after waving uh, Deron? Who, who the hell is going to score for you guys? You're going to give it to uh, Brooke Lopez in the post every single time, every single play. I mean, you can only do that for so long. So, there's really um, not much for the Nets to do. But yeah, back to the Cavs, sorry, anyway. Uh, they re-signed Del Vadova to a five-year deal. Uh, sorry, not a five-year deal, five million dollar deal over four years. And that's really, I mean, he, he was he was tough. There was really nothing else. Like, you know, there, w- there was that breakout game in... um. Game two, where you know he hit that flip shot against Curry in the final, so um, you know played really tough, and you know people were saying, oh, you know he's a dirty player. Oh, he played rugby in Australia. Just to set the set the record straight, just quickly, he played AFL, which is completely different from rugby league. And he's plays while he's playing tough. I wouldn't exactly say that it's dirty because you know he's hustling for the ball. He's doing um, what every NBA player would be doing. Um, you know, say like a Patrick Beverly, they're good players, but just not necessary elite players. They're using that toughness uh, to their advantage. They know themselves that 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 they aren't the best players. So, I mean, you got to do something to fit yourself in the league. And I mean, he's being paid five million dollars over the next few years, and hell, why not? You know, come off the bench, back up Kyrie Irving, come out, hit some shots, and that's all you can really do for him. So, just um, he's got a good role. There's really nothing else to it, and. Hopefully Kyrie Kyrie comes back better than ever, and um, Kevin Love after re-signing um, with the Cavs, one of the other deals I actually forgot to mention. Um, hopefully they've got a good squad for next year. I mean they still need some be- some depth in their bench. You know they've got J- they've still got J.R. Smith um, to sign if they want him or not, but he's going to be asking for a lot of money. You know when you hit eight threes against the Hawks and just you know absolute bombs then um, I suppose you're going to be de- demanding a fair bit of money. So he's the type of player that would sign for one year and then um, wait for the cap explosion and then sign on for another four. So don't be surprised if he signs a one-year deal with uh, some you know middle-of-the-table team. Maybe look at you know maybe the Suns or something like that. Maybe he goes back to the Knicks. Just a one-year deal with them. See how he goes. Puts up some crazy numbers on a bad team and then comes back to a title contender. You know, maybe he comes back to the Cavs. You know, we'll see. Um, we'll have to see how he goes, but... He's one of those players that can win your game or lose your game. He, he definitely proved that in um, the Golden State series, and then um, you know in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Hawks, like I said earlier, just put up eight threes in one game, absolute bombs, and just really kill them up. Especially from an athleticism standpoint, he's definitely even at an older age at twenty nine, definitely one of the the better players, uh, better athletic uh, shooting guards. Sorry. Uh, so don't be surprised. Yeah, they might re-sign him for one year and then you know re-sign him again after that, or he might leave. You know, who knows? It's J.R. Smith. He's crazy. So you know. Anyway, so with Kevin Love, I'll uh, t- talk a bit about him. You know, re-signing on for five years, put up a um a short post on the Players Tribune for um as a senior editor, which I thought <laughs> thought was really funny. Um, you know, he's got unfinished business still in um Cleveland to do. So uh, look for him to come out. He I, I never saw him as a great fit for the Cavaliers. He was always going to be that scapegoat scapegoat for them. You know, they did have a, um, you know, before Verjao went down uh, through injury, they did have a good center there and he could, they wanted him to space the floor as their um, power forward. But 
one of uh, Kevin Love's one of the main points of one of the main skills, sorry, that he had was hitting that um you know getting those offensive rebounds and then coming in putting it back up. He was averaging twenty six and thirteen um with the Timberwolves before he signed with the Cavs. So uh, before he got traded to the Cavaliers, sorry. So I mean, you know, he can space the floor. He's a decent shoot three point shooter. Like there's no doubt about that, but. It can't be his main, um, the main aspect of his game that's being utilized the most. And so, of course, you know, throughout the year, they saw, you know, Cavaliers at one point were at nine and eight, similar to the Heat. You know, they, um, you know, LeBron sat out for two weeks. Kevin Love became the main point of their offense, and Kyrie Irving. They said, "Well, you guys are stuffing up. You know, LeBron's not here, but you guys are still two all stars, and this and that, and this and that, and all this stuff for them." And um. So, I mean, he, he got hammered by, by the media and by Cleveland fans. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he signed with someone else this offseason. Like, there was strong links to Houston, strong links to L.A. Um, and, you know, if he left, then, I, I mean, the Cavaliers would probably still be fine, to be honest with you. But there's still, um, yeah, like he said, unfinished business for them, to, for them this season. You want to see them, yeah, do well and just... Especially Cavalier, especially for Kevin Love, because I do feel for him. He he is a good player, top twenty player in the league, and just um, you want to see him get that you know all star form back. You know it, it's crap to see him scoring you know t- uh, eighteen points a game and ten rebounds. Like given any other player, like say JJ Hicks or something, when they're putting up numbers like that, which he was with the Blazers almost um, a few years ago. Um, given any other players, then yeah, it should be good, but. You know, when it's Kevin Love, you know there's that potential for him to be a 30 and 30 guy. Um, you know, to see him become a shell of his former self like um, he did this season was really, uh, really off-putting to watch. And just, you know, there, there's just so much more to his game than uh, he lets on. So, um, yeah, really not much else to say for him. You just want to see him come back from injury. Him and Kelly Olenek are on good terms, apparently. Um, Olenek sent him a text and they went back and forth and... Kevin Love said, yep, no hard feelings. So, uh, thank God that's out of the way because there was more talks of, you know, Olenek being a dirty player. So, I think people just tend to forget that basketball, even though it's it's technically not supposed to be a contact sport, there's going to be hit and, you know, people are going to hit each other, going to bump into each other. You know, in rare cases, um, like J.R. Smith going to get whacked in the face um, like he did with Boston last year. Um, it's a contact sport no matter which way you look at it. So... You know, there's um there's going to be that potential for injuries, and it's just you know it's part of the game. So yeah, uh, moving on anyway. So we've got uh, Mark Gasol re-signing for another five years with the Grizzlies. This was really a um, no-brainer. I I think he even said himself, you know, I'm not meeting with anyone else but the Grizzlies. So um you know you couldn't imagine Gasol with anyone else. Maybe um what's <laughs> except for when he was with the Lakers and that was you know rookie year and whatnot, but. Uh, you know, he's really coming into his own, you know, averaging 16 and 8 um, rebounds. But, he, you know, it's his defensive presence. While, um, you know, I gave a lot of hate to Tyson Chandler before for being, you know, just a defensive player. But Gasol's shooting touch, you know, from mid-range, finishing inside, you know, his versatility especially. Um, you know, he can fit, hit free throws. Just um, just a class above Tyson Chandler. And, you know, I mean, definitely, definitely um, worthy of a max, max contract. So... Um, you know, they'll be Grizzlies will be up there again with the with the NBA um, in the playoffs, sorry. And you know, as long as Zebo's there, they've still got their core team. And you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see if they um, probably made the second round, maybe the conference finals. It'd be pushing it like you'd have to hope for um, a few, you know, for you know the ball to roll your way. You'd have to hope for a bit of luck. But they are a good team. You know, they are a grit and grind team. But just when you run into uh, the Golden State Warriors were so fast-paced and they can hit a three in your face over and over, you know, just absolutely relentless. When you come up a team like that, and then that's where you get stuck. So, while they're not lucky in all-star power, I mean, they do have Mike Conley and, you know, probably the most underrated point guard of um, the current NBA generation. And, you know, Zach Randolph is going to give you 15 points and seven rebounds. Gasol is going to give you those sort of numbers. Vince Carter, I think he re-signed with them as well. Um, you know, he's he's not, you know, Vintage Vince Carter throwing down dunks and everything, but you know, good role player who hit a three for you. Um, but the trouble is with the Grizzlies, he's the only one who's going to hit a three for you. They they shot something like six threes a game last year. Um, really, just no, just re- reluctant. I don't know if it was based on skill or where it was coaching. 
um, just did not want to go near the three-point line. Everything was inside. And once uh, Conley, Conley came back for them for the playoffs, then you could tell straight away that uh, they were a, um, you know, they, there was that outside range. You know, I think two of his first three shots were three-pointers, so it immediately made Curry have to defend properly. But, um, yeah, throughout the season, just averaging such a low number. And then, you know, compared to the Rockets, for example, um, you know, they're shooting like 25-something three-pointers a game. So, eventually, um, you know, the Rockets have done the mats. I haven't. But, you know, when you're shooting that many, the law of averages works out. You're going to end up hitting 33% of them or so. And, you know, you hit five threes a game. That's already, what, 15 points. Easy. So, that can be the difference between winning a game losing a game. Or, you know, blowing out a team or... I'm getting blown out yourself. So um, there's only there is room for improvement for the Grizzlies. Grizzlies, but um, the way they play as a um, defensive unit, as a their offensive, um, you know, their offensive prowess always well not always, but gets slowed down a, a quite a fair bit. You can only run through Gasol so much. You can only do you know Zebo mid range jump shot for so long. Uh, there's only so much to it. So um, yeah, just going through uh, my blog to <laughs> recap what I've gone through. We've got David Lee being traded away for um, from the from the Warriors to the Celtics. Um, so he was pro- he was the second highest paid player on the um, Warriors uh, this year, and averaged what eight minutes a game. So really nothing. Um, really just a salary dump. So they had, they had to trade him away, and I think pretty sure they included a um, second round pick for him because I mean. There's no way anyone would take on David Lee and his salary for no money whatsoever. Like, there's um, they got to take for just money. Sorry, so the Celtic, the Warriors, sorry, got back um, uh, Gerald Wallace, who's you know getting old, been in the league, God knows how long, 15 years now, I think it is. Um, averaged one point, you know, half a rebound a game last year. So I mean, really just a swap of salary for salary. But I suppose um, Wallace can really just invigorate the young guys i mean it's really pushing it like it's really um it really is so i mean david lee you'd hate to see him leave but you can tell he's going to be a productive player he's 32 at the moment um he'll still be productive you know give it another two three years he'll be a good player for the celtics maybe they trade him over, trade him away again who knows what danny Ainge has in store for them but um you know you could tell just on facebook and instagram and twitter all the players love david lee you know goodbye to my older bro this and that and um, you know, it's going to be sad to see him go, but he just doesn't fit in with Steve Kerr's play style. So you'd hate to see a player of his caliber leave a team, especially after winning a title. Um, but yeah, that's just how it is. He actually um, ended up buying the uh, the Vegas trip to celebrate um, what's his, the, ch- the title, sorry. Uh, he paid for all of it. So I mean, kind of balances out in the end. He, he knows he was the highest played, second highest paid player on the team and you know, when you're getting, getting paid that much, then I suppose um, he knows what he's doing uh, when he's trying to um, make it, make it up to the team. You know, it's one big family, so yeah. Go and really, I think so far no other really big moves. Uh, yeah, Leandro Barbosa resigning Ginobili with San Antonio, as I already said. Uh, Jeremy Lin went to the Hornets, so I think um. He's really just he not the same player that he used to be with um the Knicks the first time round. Like just um you know, decent playmaker, uh good basketball intelligence I have to say, but you know, terrible with his left hand. He'll dribble, dribble, dribble and then dish off, shot clock buzzer, um, violation, and just really um you know, he he's a solid point guard. I mean Mo Williams signed with the Cavaliers on a two year deal. Um, so the Hornets did need a player to come in as a backup guard for Kemba Walker, but, um, yeah, he's, um, jump shot, jump shooting hasn't really improved. You know, he dipped 2% since, um, 2011. So, I mean, it's been consistent, um, but it hasn't been great. So, you know, with a player like him, you're just looking for a lot more production, especially, you know, on a, on a um, and on an above average Hornets team, um, that's really all you can ask. Just, you know. Go out there, score some points, do what you can. But I mean, in the end, Jeremy Lin, Lin Sanity is not coming back, and um, you know he'll be, he'll be in the NBA for you know the rest of his career, bouncing around here and there. But uh, I can never see him averaging another you know twenty five and six, twenty five and seven season ever again. So 
Um, on you know, in talk, speaking about point guards, uh, Reggie Jackson, Reggie Jackson, so <laughs> re-signing with the Pistons on a four-year, eighty million dollar deal. Um, I think Jackson's pretty much a perfect perfect fit for the um, Pistons. Really, just the you know, he's a tough point guard. He's got that that mentality. The reason why he left uh, or got traded rather for Kyle Singler and whatnot, uh, he pretty much was saying, you know, I deserve to be starting point guard. Westbrook's out, but God damn it, you know, I want to be leading a team and. Well, you know, when you've got a Thunder team full of Durant, Westbrook, and um, Ibaka, then there's really no shots for him. You know, Durant's going to be putting up hit plenty of shots a game. Westbrook, don't even get me started, you know, putting up so many points. Um, so, I mean, you know, he's still a young player. He's like 24, 25. He's going to be playing really well for them. Average, you know, 17 points, 5 rebounds, 9 assists for the um, Pistons ball who was there. So, I mean... Definitely one of the better point guards, better young point guards in the league as it is. Um, only thing is, his three point shooting, you know, probably definitely definitely needs to be improved. And the Pistons are really in limbo at the moment, making their way up slowly. They did just acquire Marcus Morris and um, a few other players, but um, yeah, they're playing a really, really well focused inside game. There really there isn't any outside shooting. Sure, you got uh, Caldwell Pope, and I think. Um, What's his name? Uh, oh, I've lost it now. Yeah, anyway. Um, the small forward... Karan Butler. There we go. Um, you know, Karan Butler. I think he uh, he's taken off. So, I mean, there goes your outside shooting pretty much. You know, Kyle Singler, while he was with them, did pretty well for them. But, you know, he was a, um average player at best. And... um. So yeah, I think for the Pistons to really advance and become a better Eastern Conference team, which isn't the very that isn't that hard considering it's the Eastern Conference, um, they really need to start hitting outside shots and just um, I mean you can work inside when you've got Andre Drummond and um, you know they used to have Greg Monroe who's taken off to Milwaukee. Uh, when you've got Andre Drummond down there, by all means, you know take it down there and hammer it inside. I mean, he's slowly developing an offensive game, but. Um, he'll be another Tyson Chandler, Zaza Pachulia kind of player. Um, but we you know when he's that big and still that dominant, then you know why not give him give him the ball, let him develop. You know he's probably been working on a jump shot, or maybe not a jump shot, maybe a jump hook this off season. Um, so yeah, you know give him a chance and see how they go. But it'll still be a while for the Pistons to actually make that leap into the Eastern Conference because you know you do have the heat at the bottom of the barrel. You've got. Um, you know, some all these other teams coming through. Um, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, sorry, Brooklyn's still there. I mean, any team with Brook Lopez is going to do relatively well. So, um, yeah, it'll be a tough season for the Pistons, I think. So, yeah. Uh, moving on again, we've got Lou Williams signing with the Lakers. You know, six, current sixth man of the year, three year deal worth $21 million. So, um, I think pretty good deal for the Raptors, to be honest. But for the Lakers, it's uh, not so much because they've already... Lou Williams, uh, coming off the bench, averaged 16 to 18 points a game. And he was putting up a crap load of shot, like just shooting the ball, maybe not even lights out, just shot after shot after shot after shot. And just absolutely, um, ab- like just you know, putting the ball in the net, but also putting it, you know, into the team in the other, ha- the other team's hands, sorry. So, um... You know, from Bill Simmons, he, every team needs an irrational confidence guy, but I think the Lakers, if you include Lou Williams, that'll make three. Um, it'll be, you know, Kobe Bryant, who's, you know, getting getting there in age. He's still got that $2 million, 46, no, sorry, two-year, $46 million deal. Uh, Nick Young, who, you know, made infamous because of that shot where he put up a three, turn around, start to celebrate, then clanked it off the cylinder. And, um, Lou Williams coming in, he really, I mean, he'll he'll take them up, he'll take him shoot, he'll take their shooting percentages up probably. I mean, he's not the most efficient player, but um, you know he'll put points he'll put points on the board. But there's really um, no need for the Lakers to pick him up. I mean, it'll maybe take them to a playoff team, like bottom eight. Like I mean, you got to look the the Western Conference is absolutely stacked at the moment. And the Lakers are right at the bottom. Like, I mean, you want to see Kobe finish finish his career properly and on a high. But, um, you know, with a team like what they have, you know, they just got rid of Jordan Hill. You know, they were hoping to sign um, Kevin Love, hoping to sign Russell Westbrook. I mean, that's not going to happen. As much as Westbrook and um, Durant apparently feud, 
Um, you know, Durant might get pissed off at him for all his shooting. You know, he, he's not about to leave a situation with Oklahoma City Thunder to go, um, uh, to go hang out, you know, in LA. You know, it's a great city and all that. I've been there myself. It's absolutely amazing. It's something else. But I mean, when you're going on a team who did absolutely terribly last year, same same situation with the New York Knicks. I mean, you know, you're not going to leave a championship caliber team to go play with this rubbish team who was in the lottery. And I mean, it was good that they picked up D'Angelo Russell. Um, like I said earlier, I'm not a big college guy, not a big NBA draft. But you know, watching a bit of summer league, you know, he he's definitely got game. Give him give him the starting point guard spot, and um, he'll t- you know he'll turn some heads, but he won't light up anyone too badly. So. You know, it's um, it's hard to see so so many storied franchises. So, you know, you got the Celtics who are struggling at the moment. <laughs> you know, that they've stockpiled maybe you know half a million picks. Then you got the Lakers, you know, with their rubbish team at the moment. Then you got the Knicks with Carmelo Anthony. You know, pretty much it's a pretty much a one man team. I mean, you can't look at it in any other way. You got Jose Calderon and his ham farm back in Spain. Um, I've, yeah, it's hard to see so many storied franchises being turned around like this and playing so poorly. So. Definitely a new era in the NBA at the moment. But, um, yeah, there's also, just to finish off, uh, Anthony Davis signing with the Pelicans on $145 million deal. Uh, so it's a five-year contract extension, so it'll, it'll mean, it means another six years with them. And um, I'm pretty sure the fourth year is a player option, but uh, I'm sure the Pelicans will do everything they can to keep him there. So, yeah, five-year deal, $145 million. The funny thing is... Anthony Davis hasn't played a single minute with Alvin Gentry as head coach. And Gentry is a great offensive leader. Great offensive uh, coach, sorry. Uh, defensively, Davis is pretty much already set. Gentry reportedly wants him to um, step out into the corner and start shooting threes. So, you know, don't um, don't be surprised if you see Anthony Davis' percentage, three-point percentage, up to like 33% or so. Because he'll be taking it. You know, he'll be, he's hands down, no argument whatsoever that he's the man on that team, there is no one else, Eric Gordon, you know, good luck with that, Tyreek Evans, you know, he's a sh- shell of himself since his rookie season, so much promise, just um, gone, you know, played aver- average with um, the Sacramento Kings, and once he mo- moved to the Pelicans, definitely did improve, but, um, you know, Anthony Davis, this is the next superstar, guys, like, there is, there's nothing else to it, um, you know, this, this new deal takes him from uh, 23 to 29, like, this is his prime years, um, there's really, you know, I think, you're looking back, in a few years' time, this will be an absolute bargain of a deal, you know, with the cap explosion, with everything taken into account, I mean, don't be surprised if, uh, Davis wins an MVP, don't be surprised if he wins a defensive player of the year, um, this guy's gonna go crazy, I can tell you right now, I mean, everyone's been saying it, I'm just reaffirming it, this guy's gonna go nuts over the next few years, you know, he led the NBA in blocks in back-to-back seasons this year. Um, he's got a great outside touch, not from three-point land, but mid-range. You know, inside, he'll throw it down. He's got a great um, series of moves he can take to the basket. Um, yeah, there's really not that much else to say for him. It's going to be this deal will take him into his prime. Hopefully, the Pelicans can adjust with him and make sure that, um, you know, he stays there because you'd have to see such a good young player leave at Pe- uh, um a franchise that has a pelican as their mascot, so you know it'd be really, really bad days for them, especially um since they <laughs> since he, thank God he got a makeover. I got to say Pierre the pelican, absolutely scary when they first introduced him. Uh, so moving on anyway, uh, Kawhi Leonard. I think this will be my last point for you guys anyway. Uh, yeah, Kawhi Leonard, five year, ninety million dollar deal. Forgot to mention this with the Spurs talk earlier actually. Um, so yeah, the, he and Lamarcus Aldridge will be the next. You know the next generation, the next era of Spurs players to um, take the team forward, and well, don't be surprised if Popovich is there until he's in a wheelchair at 95 or so. So I mean, uh, Leonard had a great season last year. Surprisingly, won Defensive Player of the Year. It was um kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, he was just missed a handful of games, missed more than a handful of games with injury. You know, had that eye infection, had a slight wrist problem. But, you know, while he was on the court, he was a lockdown defender, average, you know, 14 points, 8 rebounds, 7 rebounds. Um, it'll never be great numbers with him. It's just what he does on the court. He's got such great length, you know. His hands are, you know, the size of a watermelon. I mean, you know, uh, that's a really bad example. But, you know, he's got big hands. Let's just leave it at that. Um, 
he's going to be leading the team. Him and uh, LA are going to have a great combination together to, um, you know, lead this Spurs team forward. I mean, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with post Ginobili and Duncan. And, um, you know, the Spurs, yeah, it's a brilliant move for them. It, it, was a, it was a no-brainer to re-sign Leonard. I mean, earlier this year, he um, declined the uh, player option to sign a contract extension, uh, which makes sense. I mean, most players do that to... Um, you make you end up saving a bit of money. You end up making a bit more money, sorry. And I think the Spurs are more than willing just to put that through. So, uh, yeah, easy, no brainer for them. And I don't think anyone else were really front runners for to resign to sign Leonard. So Spurs were saying, just wait, let us get LA signed. We've got your deal ready. Let's just sort this out, and then we'll go through. So, yeah, that's it for our um, free agency special. And um. I'll try and keep this up as a weekly podcast. I'm also going to be doing um, Premier League or just general world football um, podcasts as well. Probably get a few people in. And so, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, my um, it's mostly going to be NBA. I mean, I'll put them up as separate podcasts. So, yeah, NBA one will be once a week. Premier League one, I think, once the season starts, will be weekly as well. But for now, it'll be maybe every fortnight uh, just to cover transfers and whatnot. And so I think the idea for me is to, um, I'll get some people in, you know, some guests, you know, no big names, obviously, I'm, I'm 19, for God's sake. Um, you know, just get a few mates in, talk about soccer, just easy listening, nothing, um, you know, nothing too harsh. I'm not going to, one thing you'll find with me is I'll probably never, bo- I'll never really bombard, bombard you with uh, statistics and, you know, uh, player efficiency rating and uh, PIE and all this other crap. Like, I mean, it's, it's good measurements and um, definitely helps out in, uh, the analysis of the players, but I think for me, my, um, I think just the eye test is probably the best way for me to judge players anyway, so, yeah, I'll get some guys in, we can talk about some football, talk about, uh, basketball, and yeah, hopefully, it'll work out really well, and again, so just, uh, best way to contact me is through the Facebook page, just Two Ball Blog, um, hopefully get that going up and running, I'll be posting all my links from the website onto that page. Uh, so best way to see the website through there. I'm just running through Wix at the moment. And then once I get a bigger following, I'll be um, creating my own website. Um, if you do need to see it, it's uh, sebastianquinn.wix.com forward slash two ball blog or one word. Uh, so that website again, it's sebastianquinn.wix.com forward slash two ball blog. So if you need to check it out directly, head to there. Uh, like I said earlier, best way to get through it is to the Facebook page, and then I'll be posting links on that all the time. And then, um, yeah, also through Twitter, tweet me. It's uh, Sebasian underscore Quinn, S-E-B-A-S-I-A-N underscore Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N. Uh, so tweet me, ask me questions, and uh, I'll put it on Facebook. I'll uh, probably put it on the podcast. It'll give me some time to talk about. Something to talk about, sorry. Uh, in terms of length, I'll probably try and keep it to an hour. I mean... Um, I can only talk so much by myself, and you guys are probably sick of hearing my voice, to be honest. And um, you know, it's definitely slowing down. I mean, I just, I just caught up on like a week's worth of free agency in an hour. So um, I'll think of some segments to put in. I'll think of some other stuff to do, and uh, hopefully, it'll. I'll stay on top of it, and you know, wish me luck. <laughs> I'll see you guys next week, and thanks for listening. See ya.